This is part two of the lectures on imaging of the salivary glands. There are two main clinical scenarios that we encounter when we are evaluating the salivary glands. One is a mass in the gland and the other is swelling and pain in the gland. Let's first address masses of the salivary glands. So the most common tumors that arise in the glands depend on which gland you're talking about. The vast majority of tumors arising in the parotid gland are benign. In fact, only 20% are malignant and 80% are benign. In the submandibular gland, it's a little more even. Half of them are malignant and half of them are benign. Once you get to the smaller sublingual glands and also the minor salivary glands, that original ratio reverses and 80% are malignant, but only 20% are benign. Let's look at the most common tumors to affect the salivary glands. Benign tumors that affect the salivary glands include pleomorphic adenoma, Worthen's tumor, benign monomorphic adenomas, oncocytomas, and oncocytic papillary cyst adenomas. Of these, the two most common by far are pleomorphic adenoma and Worthen's tumor. Pleomorphic adenoma is so common that it accounts for 80% of the benign tumors in the salivary gland. Now, if you consider that 80% of the tumors in the, in the parotid are benign and 80% of those are pleomorphic adenoma, you see that the majority of lesions encountered in the parotid gland are in fact pleomorphic adenomas. So when you're putting together a differential diagnosis, that's a smart place to start. How about malignancies? The most common malignancy to affect the parotid gland is mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Close behind is adenoid cystic carcinoma, and then there are a wide variety of less common diseases, including adenocarcinoma, acinic cell carcinoma, carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, which we'll talk about more, ductal carcinoma, which is histologically similar to the ductal carcinoma that arises in the breast, and a true malignant mixed tumor. This is a combined carcinosarcoma that can arise within the parotid gland, and it is extremely rare. Some people apply the term malignant mixed tumor when referring to carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, uh, but many authors prefer to reserve that term, term for a true malignant mixed tumor. Let's focus on pleomorphic adenoma. This is the most common mass within the salivary glands overall and within the parotid glands specifically. Uh, the term benign mixed tumor is a synonym for pleomorphic adenoma. This disease predominantly affects females over the age of 40, although there are plenty of male patients and plenty of younger patients into their teen years and even into the first decade of life. Pleomorphic adenomas are generally well demar demarcated, at least radiographically. In truth, there are small tendrils of disease that extend out from the capsule into the surrounding soft tissue, which makes pleomorphic adenomas very difficult to resect, and it makes it very likely that if a wide local excision is not performed, that these will recur. They tend to have mild heterogeneous enhancement, but in truth, the enhancement characteristics of pleomorphic adenomas vary widely because they are, as the name suggests, pleomorphic. Occasionally, pleomorphic adenomas will calcify, although that's not typical. One finding that's very important is that pleomorphic adenomas may be extremely bright on T2. How bright? Even brighter than the CSF. While this is not a sensitive sign in that many pleomorphic adenomas are not that bright, when you see it, you can be certain that you're looking at a pleomorphic adenoma. It's a very specific sign. Pleomorphic adenomas are dangerous because they can undergo malignant degeneration, and depending on which part of the tumor degenerates, you get a variety of different histopathologies. This is referred to as carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. This occurs at a relatively high rate, such that all pleomorphic adenomas should be resected to prevent the risk of malignancy. When 
Polymorphic adenomas do recur. They recur in a pattern that we refer to as a cluster of grapes. There are numerous small recurrences that occur throughout the surgical bed, and each one of them forms a rounded tumor, cluster of grapes. Here's an example of a pleomorphic adenoma in the superficial lobe of the right parotid gland. You can see that it has a rim of enhancement and some heterogeneous central enhancement and that it is well defined. There's nothing about this image that would be specific for a pleomorphic adenoma, but it is the most common tumor and thus would probably be at the top of our differential diagnosis. Here's another example of a pleomorphic adenoma. This tumor is extending through the stylomandibular tunnel that we talked about earlier. That's pretty characteristic of a pleomorphic adenoma. Um, when you see a mass in the deep lobe that extends through the stylomandibular tunnel, it's even more likely to be a pleomorphic adenoma than a random tumor in the parotid gland would be. Although this tumor is bright, it's not brighter than the CSF, so we can't be absolutely certain that we're dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma, although that is what this turned out to be. Here's another example of a mass that arose within the deep lobe of the parotid, but is extending, knuckling out through that stylomandibular tunnel. So that's suggestive of pleomorphic adenoma. But what really clinches it for us is the comparison of the T2 signal between the CSF and the tumor. This tumor has CSF signal even brighter than CSF, a T2 signal even brighter than CSF, which is a very specific sign for this disease, pleomorphic adenoma. Here is an example of recurrent pleomorphic adenoma. Here is one focus of recurrence. There's one, 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 there's one. These are all recurrences of the pleomorphic adenoma throughout the surgical bed. This occurs because of an incomplete resection at the time of initial surgery. The next tumor that we will discuss is Warthin's tumor. This has several synonyms including adenolymphoma and papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. As the name suggests, there is a lymphatic component to Warthin's tumor. This makes them essentially exclusive to the parotid gland because, as you recall, the other salivary glands do not have lymphoid tissue. Only 15% of Warthin's tumors are multifocal, and yet it is renowned for being multifocal. The reason is that not much else is multifocal among primary parotid lesions, and so Warthin's tumor, even though it's only a minority of them that are multifocal, is famous for being multifocal. This can be either tumors, multiple tumors within a single gland, or tumors on both sides of the face. Warthin's tumors typically undergo some degree of cystic degeneration and thus are non-enhancing centrally. They do take up technetium-99 protechnitate and thus are often seen as incidental findings on those studies. It is rare to perform the technetium examination for the purpose of identifying this tumor. This is an example of a Warthin's tumor within the superficial lobe of the left parotid. Notice that it is essentially non-enhancing, which is reflective of that cystic degeneration. Here's another Warthin's tumor. This one has become superinfected, and you can see not only an enhancing rim, which might be seen in an uninfected tumor, but a lot of edema in the surrounding tissues. Here it is looking bright on um, on T2 weighted images, not as bright as CSF, but bright because it is cystic in nature. Here's an example of a Warthin's tumor demonstrating the multifocality, one, two, three lesions in the superficial lobe. 